Welcome to One Dime Radio. Today, I am joined with the Blockchain Socialist, host of the Blockchain Socialist. And today, we're going to be talking about none other than blockchain. Uh, something that's very misunderstood, not just by the left, but virtually by most people. Understandably so, it's pretty hard to understand, hard to get into all these things like um, decentralized autonomous organizations. What's that? You know, A lot of people don't know about uh, just exactly blockchain technology, and I totally get that. But at the same time, there's a lot of people who will be very quick to give their hot takes on what they think of crypto without knowing very little about it. And often, many people's first impressions of cryptocurrency is that of NFTs, Bitcoin, and the very annoying right-wing libertarians who think that the Bitcoin is the future for, of world currency and will replace the US dollar. But we're going to give a bit of a sobering analysis, and blockchain socialist has a lot of experience in this field, and knows a lot about it, and hosts a wonderful podcast about it, which I've been on. You can check out that episode in the description. But what would Marx think of Bitcoin? Or what would Marx think of cryptocurrency? It was Dogecoin. Dogecoin, actually. yeah. Clickbait title, but it was like it was an <laughs> awesome podcast. It was yeah. great. Um, <laughs> but without further ado, uh, before getting into the more interesting questions, which I find, uh, I really think not many people talk about, and that is, what are like the actual use cases of crypto that can benefit the left? But I think before we even get to that, uh, two questions. What is cryptocurrency and what got you into cryptocurrency? Because this might be obvious for some, but for some people, it just the whole episode won't make sense if they don't know this. Yeah. So that's a, that, it's, a, that's a, it's a big question actually to answer. It's a bigger question than, than, than people think it is to answer because cryptocurrency can be uh, a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And it depends on sort of like the lens that you want to look at it. But uh, in short, if we think of at least Bitcoin, Bitcoin was the very first cryptocurrency, which was created by a mysterious man or woman or a group of people uh, named Satoshi Nakamoto, who sort of gathered a bunch of uh, cryptographers to help him build. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, sort of uh, in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, he published a white paper called um, it's like peer to peer cash bitcoin um, and it was a way that detailed how to create a monetary system without needing some sort of centralized authority and so he basically combined a bunch of different like cryptographic protocols and uh, technologies as well as connections to the internet as a way to facilitate that system um, it was at the same time not only like a technical uh, type of achievement because uh, this idea of having a monetary system that was sort of separate from the government, separate separate from banks, was not a new one. It was one that really like uh, a lot of people in the cryptography space, in the cypherpunk space, were really really interested in solving. The problem with solving that problem was uh, the thing that they needed to solve was called the double spending problem, um, where you know on a computer it's very easy to copy things. So whenever you send an email, what you're doing is basically sending a copy of that email to someone else. So if I write an email to you, you'll get a copy of that email that I wrote from my email client. So it's not like a letter that I'm sending back and forth. It's, uh, it's, it's a different type of relationship. And because computers are very good at doing that, and that's sort of like the default mode of doing things, it makes it very difficult to create a monetary, monetary system to do that because if you... Uh, you know, send a dollar, like as if you would send an email, all you're doing then is copying a dollar. So it doesn't really make sense as like some sort of form of, of cash or something like that over the internet. Uh, so Bitcoin solved this problem using uh, a thing called proof of work, which is actually a cryptographic mechanism that was actually used to prevent spam email. Uh, and combined with a couple of other different protocols as a way to sort of systematize it and like make it something that was self-sustainable. Uh, uh, and so the underlying sort of structure of what Bitcoin used after Bitcoin was released was later termed to be called blockchain because it was literally a chain of blocks of data, that data being the transactions that were being submitted to the network and so uh, people with 
you know, different ideas about money or different ideas about how a cryptocurrency system should work, sort of took that idea and sort of like changed it over time to mean a lot of different other things. Um, so they could, a, a cryptocurrency could use a blockchain system. In fact, most of them probably do, but some of them use slight variations of what a blockchain is. So uh, at a broader sense, a blockchain is part of a family of types of databases called a distributed ledger technology. So it may not be a blockchain, but um, most of the cryptocurrencies that are famous that you probably know are, uh, they use some sort of blockchain infrastructure to fill to facilitates like the system itself. Um, but so a blockchain is essentially a peer to peer network in which many nodes on that network sort of keep track of the state of the ledger. So they keep track of the history of the transactions. They, when they say a blockchain, uh, it is like a chain of transactions which are organized like a ledger would be. And therefore all of these different nodes are keeping track of that ledger and sort of verifying with one another, hey, is this, is this the state of the ledger? Is that the state of the ledger? And by doing that over time, very, very quickly, because they're computers, they can sort of agree on what is like um, the single source of truth. Uh, and so in that idea, uh, sort of like spawned a million other different projects and different ways of, of thinking about it. Um, and so how I got into cryptocurrency, to be honest, is not very inspiring, I think. <laughs> Mostly I was broke and um, uh, I had a lot of debt to pay off. And I was working a really shitty job. And so I was looking at different types of ways to sort of make money. I was doing gig work on the side of like my other full-time work. And I found, I stumbled across cryptocurrency as like something to like look into. And I did after I had looked into like stocks uh, as something to like play around with in which I failed horribly. Um, and I tried, uh, I just looked into cryptocurrency and the, uh, so the specific cryptocurrency that was like interesting to me at that time, which was, this was like in like 2016 was Ethereum. And Ethereum had this added functionality of smart contracts, uh, which sort of is a way to um, program money in a way that is also where you don't need like a third party in the middle to facilitate that's, that's uh, worth an agreement. That's elaborating a little bit, actually. It's very quick. Is Smart contracts is like something that Bitcoin can't facilitate. And it's like a key, diff right. like big difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin. Uh, would you mind elaborating on that a bit? Because that's something I find really interesting. So, right, on the on the Bitcoin blockchain, the only thing that you can do is send and receive Bitcoin, more or less. Uh, there isn't much functionality outside of that ability. Whereas with the with with Ethereum, which was created in I believe 2014 or 2015, um, it proposed the idea of um, money being able to be programmed. So right with Bitcoin, you say we can use computers and the internet and cryptographic protocols to facilitate this monetary system. Uh, if that's the case, then Ethereum proposes that if we go one step further, we can then, since we are using computers, we can program that money to do things under set circumstances. So like a, like an if then statement. So like if something happens, um, if some conditions are met, then make my money, make my cryptocurrency do this. Um, and so uh, by using sort of a programming language that is Turing complete, that means that you can theoretically create almost an infinite amount of different uh, sort of type of situations in which uh, you can create using this functionality with the affordance that it doesn't require a third party to sort of facilitate that agreement. And that's pretty important, right? Because like a third party is often how like control is monopolized and certain third parties often will profit from the rent extraction of people using it, right? So it's this, it's a way to like kind of perform a sort of, um, you know, a, an action really, what it can encompass so many things between different people that doesn't require this third party. I mean, uh, to a certain extent, like what, what, what would wait, what would be some, um, it's, it's hard to come up with exactly like one, but what are some examples of like smart contracts being used practically? Uh, so from a practical sense, if you mean by practical, you mean like being used today, or do you mean practical as an easy to explain? I mean, practical <laughs> as an easy to explain. 
So like easy to explain would be like, for example, um, say you have, I, I don't know, you've, you've, you've purchased a, an airplane ticket, which you're going to travel somewhere. And before your flight, your flight is canceled. Uh, and so uh, if you are using a smart contract, you can have the smart contract sort of uh, say that if your flight is canceled, then give a refund of your money for that for that flight, rather than having to do like the normal thing, if you had a flight canceled, like having to call the airlines and be like, hey, my flight was canceled. Can you please give me back my money and go through this entire process of getting your refund uh, for that like purchase? So like in this way, you can sort of, um, as long as things are on chain, so if things are recorded on the blockchain itself and can be detected by the smart contract, then you can say, if these conditions are met, then make this other thing happen. And so I like that it's, it's a fairly powerful idea, but that, but that's like a, that's an easy to explain example. But the way that it's being used is slightly more complicated. Yeah, that's the issue with um, blockchain yeah. is that it's very difficult to explain and very honestly difficult to understand, even if you just try to watch YouTube videos on it. So I can see why there's like a lot of uh, widespread confusion uh, regarding cryptocurrency. Uh, but for now, I mean, what are a lot of misconceptions from the get go that when people hear about the discourse surrounding it? Um, I often think a lot of the people take more issue with who the message is coming from and the way the conclusions are drawn. Like, for example, you know, a lot of people who are into cryptocurrency are sometimes right wing libertarians. Although you mentioned the origins of crypto with um, in the origins of crypto, there was kind of like a divide between sort of left wing anarchists and right libertarians. It's, it wasn't just right-wing libertarians, right, who kind of were in, originally into it. What how it's been explained to me is that there've been there were more or less like three different uh, like political camps. Let's say you had the right-wing libertarians for sure. You had like Austrian libertarians, like Austrian school people who are really interested in in like digital money and 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 Bitcoin. For the most part, these are also people who are really interested in like digital gold. Uh, and then you had people who were uh, the cypherpunks. So these are people who were really interested in privacy and using cryptography to sort of hide digital messages over the internet. I think they were, um, so that group of people also had like left and right wing tendencies. Although I will concede that like a lot of the ones who were into cryptocurrency tended to be the more right wing ones. Like Julian Assange was a was a cypherpunk. He was part of that group, and I wouldn't say that Julian Julian Assange is really like a, a super right wing dude. Not at all. Um, unless I'm like unless I'm like really missing something about his life, I, I wouldn't really characterize him that way. And then you had the third group was like open source advocates who were really into open source software and like providing software as like a public good, basically. Um, so it was like this confluence of like different groups who were really there in the beginning and who had a lot of different ideas and thoughts on like, you know, why the creation of something like Bitcoin would be important and different reasons for that. Um, so like, I think a big misconception is that like, like you said, that it's only right wing. Um, I think there is a lot of right-wing tendencies within the space for sure that, 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 that I won't lie about. Um, but, uh, I think a big reason was that, I mean, really like there were no leftists involved in that, in that process, um, for, you know, various reasons that we can speculate on. But, um, I think the, the open source people tended to be a lot more left-wing, uh, and they also tended to be people who didn't stay with the Bitcoin community or didn't, or didn't stay as like what's called a Bitcoin maximalist, a Bitcoin maxi. So someone who only, who believes that like Bitcoin is like the solution to, to save us from yeah, all our problems like for some Dorsey reason. Jack Dorsey has kind of adopted that sort of mantra kind of. Yeah. He's kind of, he's, he's definitely a, a Bitcoin maxi. Um, but you know, it's, it, it's a super complicated, interesting space in, in my opinion. But, um, 
yeah, I mean, you know, what what is like the unfortunate truth about Bitcoin is that it is sort of like the uh, manifestation of politics in a digital space in a way that was incredibly successful. I think that's what's what's very very uncomfortable is that it was it is incredibly successful monetarily and like financially for those people who believed in it in the very beginning. To be honest, um, and so I think it is it is kind of like unfortunate that that happened, but it is sort of the truth. And I think what makes it right wing is not like is is a specific part of it. It's the sort of uh, limited supply. So it's this idea of like like the whole idea of di- the store of value idea, right? Yeah, but specifically like this hard money idea, I would say. Yeah, sound money, they always call it because they they see fiat is uh, like it's not real money. So they want to return to commodity money, um, kind of when when money was back to gold, even though it really never really was totally back to gold. Like um, there was only a very short period in history where money was fully back to gold. But like in America... People remember the gold standard, even they forget about the times we went off of it, like in World War II and World War I. But uh, I think that's, they're, they're like to hearken back to that. They perceive going off the gold standard as like, oh, they're now spending all this money and out of control, inflation, they're trying to make you poor, et cetera, et cetera. So I see like Bitcoin is like, they see that as sort of like the alternative yeah. to central banking. Yeah, definitely. Money, so I think right? like... What sort of happened as well at the creation of Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin was, it's like right before Bitcoin, you had a different project. Um, I can't remember what it's called. I think it's called like BitGold or something like that, which really was like this company held gold reserves in their own like super secure bank, um, which you could buy sort of like uh, a certain share of it. And that would be your gold that you could hold. And then, like right before Bitcoin was like getting popular, uh, Bitcoin, Bitgold, uh, I could be again, I could be wrong on the name, but they got um, they were uh, prosecuted by the government, by the U.S. government, uh, saying that they were like sort of like an illegal entity. And so, like all these people, all of these like gold bugs, they all migrated to Bitcoin right sort of at the beginning. Um, and sort of the, then you see this like marketing campaign of Bitcoin as digital gold uh, as a way to sort of, I wouldn't say, as a way to, to, to characterize itself for a normie audience. So like, so like viewing it as a, uh, as really like an investment vehicle and as like a inflationary risk management thing that like, just like makes sense to do for them. Which has a lot of like right wing assumptions, of course. Right. I mean, I think maybe before we get into the left possible use cases of blockchain, we should maybe deal with like the the whole right wing uh, prevalent uh, the uh, presence of right wing ideology, libertarian ideology specifically in um, cryptocurrency space. Because I think it's worth addressing because that's the part of crypto. I'm certainly much very critical of because yeah there is this idea like this fetishization of commodity money and i think there's a very big misunderstanding of not just how the financial system works but like just how capitalism works um there's there's a weird like apolitical activism element involved in like the libertarian fascination with bitcoin because they kind of say like unironically many of them that bitcoin can replace the us dollar and what's weird is that they sort of assume that Bitcoin will just get very big, more people invest in it, and then suddenly the US will like, I guess, realize yeah, that it's, it's very better not well thought out. somehow and then adopt it. Or that it's really not well thought out because it's like they don't even foresee that. I mean, they do say, okay, because governments can ban it, right? But the argument said that, oh, if one country bans it, then other people it will be their opportunity. So they'll start using it. But it's very possible that might not happen. Like we, we, if they really wanted to crack down on it, they probably could. Like, um, I mean, like they did with with communism, right? <laughs> it was like a global endeavor. Uh, but I don't think it's that big of a threat to the point where they are going to do that. Also, like this austerity politics, there's a general uh, a fear of government spending, 
And it's not fear of like government authoritarianism per se, even though there are people on the libertarians who are opposed to war. They are opposed to like the CIA and abstractly, like, they have, they like, are. <laughs> I guess like good point abstractly. Yeah. But the, the weird aspect is like the anti-government spending, because to me, it's weird to like look at the financial crisis and see, oh, the problem is central banks. Whereas, like, I know the problem, I guess, like, you can tie a lot of the problem to commercial banks and the separation between commercial trading and investments. That was, like, a big part of it, you know, the removal of Glass-Steagall. But, like, they always target central mm. banks. Um, and central banks, like, I mean, I'm not, like, you know, I'm not in the under delusion, in any delusion that, like, the, these people have, like, people's interests at heart. I mean, the states operate is controlled mm. completely by neoliberals but the central bank is who basically saved the uh financial crisis like i mean it would have got yeah. it would have been like the great depression if they didn't come in there and like you know increase the bank reserves and whatnot i i guess to them they would think that like the better choice would have been to let them all fail and to do nothing about it as like to let the market sort of self-correct itself which to a yeah, like the Herbert Hoover position, which was done. Yeah, for sure, for like, sure. Yeah, like people forget, like the great, the Great Depression. Like when Roosevelt wasn't like elected during, right away when the Great Depression happened, there was like a solid almost five years of the Great Depression where Herbert Hoover yeah, did yeah. absolutely nothing. Not five years, like I think it was three years, but they did literally nothing, and it was getting so much worse. And socialist movements were spreading everywhere. And it was getting to the point where Roosevelt was able to make a case to be like, you know, I like you, you, you guys want to keep your money and not either risk communism or fascism. Here, let's give people some breadcrumbs. And then he got the New Deal and whatnot. So it's like a, it's a weird general idea of history. Um, it's it's yeah, like this self-correcting free market idea i mean there's all that problem like to my listeners this is not probably a surprise like that these <laughs> this is like problematic but uh one thing that is often brought up about bitcoin which i think is more like an interesting question is okay um you know regardless if one is right wing or left wing and embraces bitcoin one common th complaint which i think has a lot of legitimacy is the insane energy consumption use that bitcoin requires um, like, for example, there's that study that's often cited, like, what was it that something like, uh, the Bitcoin electricity usage is like more than all of Argentina's electricity usage or something insane. Um, tell us a bit about that. Like, is Bitcoin really bad for the environment? And is there other alternative cryptocurrencies that are better or is this exaggerated yeah, so I think entirely? That, that, that's a really tough question uh, in the sense that it gets very heated very, very quickly. <laughs> um, but like, I totally understand. I understand the concern. I think what is the issue is that um, I, I think it is my personal view is that it's a bit of a moral panic. The, the way that people talk about energy use of the Bitcoin network, largely because if you look at the like Bitcoin overall in its energy usage as a percentage of like total energy usage it's still very very small uh and much much less than like i don't know the, the fast fashion industry than the meat industry like there's a lot a lot of different industries that come before bitcoin in terms of like the amount of energy that they're using and the amount of like waste that they produce this isn't me like defending bitcoin in any way but i think really if you put it into context of total energy use it's not like as high of a, a priority if you are really like, um, I don't know, if, if, if you are uh, an environmental activist, I don't think like necessarily your priority should be about banning Bitcoin. There's like really a, a whole lot bigger issues to solve than, than that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and there are, have, of course, like there's usually, I think maybe the one study that you quoted, I th could be the same one, like from, I think is the one that like Digiconomist always quotes, uh, which is, which actually uses a lot of really, really poor assumptions, actually, that other environmental um, scientists have like pointed out, but they just sort of like refuse to change. Um, so they've made some poor, some poor assumptions in like their, their estimations. And like, I would recommend the work of Jonathan Kumi, Dr. Jonathan Kumi. So he's, he's done some, some work on that and like where he sees the problems are and he estimates the energy usage 
as a bit lower than what Digicondom does. But like this whole issue with the energy use is uh, is correlated with the what's called the consensus mechanism of the Bitcoin network, which is called proof of work, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, the way that proof of work uh, works is that you ask for a node in the network who is sort of partaking in the um, sort of like uh, security of the network. So in Bitcoin, they're called miners, you'll usually refer them to as, where they have to expend a certain amount of energy to solve a cryptographic math problem. And then uh, with that proof of work, once they've solved it, they then earn the right to mine a block on the Bitcoin network and to add that block and they get a reward for that. And that's sort of how the, the, the security is kept intact for the network. There's no doubt like, uh, like there's an issue in the sense that proof of work is sort of correlated uh, with, or, or let's say, the likelihood of your ability to mine a block and earn a reward, so to earn Bitcoin, is correlated with exactly the amount of energy that you expend. So the more energy you expend, the more likely money you're going to make. Uh, and so like, there is uh, definitely a problem in the long term. If, if the price of Bitcoin goes really, really high, then you're incentivized to use a whole lot more energy to make sure that you are the one to win um, the, the next block in the blockchain to mine so that you can make money. And all of these, or let's say the vast majority of the nodes or miners that are part of this network, that are securing it, that are doing this work, are businesses. So like they need to make profits off of their, their mining businesses. Yeah. That's my next question is like um, a thing that's very much touted by the uh, Bitcoin libertarian folk is that this is decentralized. There's an obsession with the decentralization. But I mean, if you really look at it, like Bitcoin truly isn't decentralized. As you pointed out, a lot of Bitcoin is, is really owned by big companies, not just the trading platforms, obviously, like Coinbase, but just like big institutional investors now, like with the whales, so to speak, getting into it. Who own a like a disproportionate amount of bitcoins owned by a very small amount of people it's already not very decentralized and with with all like as it gets more quote unquote scarce because there's like a limit to how much you, uh, a limit to it really how much can be mined isn't this like just the and, and as it's more scarce there'll be more energy consumption use associated with it isn't this kind of like a you know many people would call it call it like just like a, a scam for rich people Basically, like, um, and this is to my next question is, what about like the other uh, cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, uh, Polkadot, uh, Cardano and whatnot, who uh, like are, do they face these same problems uh, when it comes to um, environmental wastefulness? And also, are they more decentralized? Is this kind of like, is, is do you see the idea that Bitcoin is kind of like, a waste a, a wasteful scam and two are are other cryptocurrencies such as ethereum are they less environmentally wasteful in in the case of when we were talking about decentralization i think what's important to keep in mind is that the word decentralization doesn't really mean anything without context so like bitcoin is it uses decentralized infrastructure like it is decentralized in the sense that it is permissionless so anybody can sort of come in and like join the network if they want to. And there is no like centralizing, there's no authority to like authenticate you and who you are and whether or not to decide you can join or not. If you have the equipment to do it, then you can. So in that way, it is decentralized. It's a peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer network, similar to how like Napster or LimeWire were peer-to-peer -peer networks that, uh, but more, they were more for like file sharing, of course. So it's decentralized in that sense. But in terms of like, uh, I guess what you're probably referring to is more like political decentralization or economic decentralization. You can you can argue you could probably argue that. But I like I think the the economics of Bitcoin of any cryptocurrency really are very closely tied to its existence within a capitalist framework and a capitalist economy. So that's the the driving force for economic centralization is not to do 
in my opinion, with the technology, but to do with the economic system that it exists within. Um, but to your point, a, like proof of work as a consensus mechanism is not the only consensus mechanism. So it's not the only way to run a, a, a blockchain network. So you have other types of consensus mechanisms. Uh, the most popular alternative is proof of stake, where instead of competing with one another by expending energy or by committing work, you instead um, you like put up as collateral a certain amount of stake of the native cryptocurrency to that blockchain uh, as a way to sort of secure the network. So you are putting up uh, you know X amount of of cryptocurrency tokens. And you have a server running or a node that is helping secure the network. And if you are not online on the time in which it's your turn to sort of mine the next block, then you would lose a part of your stake. So it's a different, it's a different type of way of creating consensus. And uh, what that ends up happening is that proof of stake uses 99.9% .9 less energy use than a proof of work consensus mechanism does. So it's a, it's a, it's not really like a, it's, it's a very, very solvable problem. Let's say there is a decreasing amount of Bitcoin being created over time, uh, which that gets less and less. So there is a, like a deflationary mechanism, uh, that's like built into the Bitcoin network that some people will say is like a feature, not a bug. That's why they like it. I would say that's like a poor way of making a monetary system. And just like as a side note, I would say that Bitcoin is not a monetary system the way that it functions. Like if you look at, you know, if you compare it to like the, the real definition of money, then like Bitcoin definitely doesn't doesn't serve that function, nor do like really any cryptocurrency at the moment. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the whole thing, right? Is like it's deflationary it makes sense if it's a, right. it's a, a lucrative asset that you want to store. It's like a store of value that makes sense. But as a monet something to replace fiat currency, it's totally ridiculous. And those who are proponents of that kind of don't even understand capitalism. Like there's a reason why every government virtually, ca capitalist government aims for around 2 to 4% inflation, because that's a sign that prices are going up. That's a healthy sign for like a market economy where you want to have uh, profits increasing. Like one of the things in Marxist economics, one of the biggest fears of capitalism that is always haunting it right. all the time is the falling rate of profit. So like, so like this idea of a deflationary currency is insane. I mean, I feel like the, like a, with with t it's hard to even imagine it being the case where like Bitcoin was like a reserve currency f for like s central banks or well like there wouldn't be central banks mm -hmm. but like for banks. Um, it 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 just the whole system would just collapse. I mean, like you need to create new money. That that that's just how all yeah. capitalist systems are kind of maintained because there is that yeah. boom bust cycle. So I, I don't. Is yeah, this so very I mean, not I, well thought I, out. I also you know just want to I mean? add like the monetary aspects of cryptocurrency and like of of blockchain system in general is probably it's like on the very bottom of my list of why I find it interesting. It's like the least interesting part of the cryptocurrency space, and it's like a shame that so many critics and people like that's what they focus on because what they're doing effectively is sort of like they're buying into the marketing rhetoric for like from like these big companies who are trying to sell bitcoin who don't like obviously they don't have your your uh your um like in, they have different intentions than you would uh, for like this whole system, right? They want to sell you a product and like, it's all fine and good to like, be like, no, your marketing like rhetoric is wrong. It's one thing, but like what you're doing is you are assuming that what their, their characterization of a thing based on a poor assessment and analysis is like the only analysis and either that is correct or it is completely wrong when I think what is much more interesting is to look at things in uh, in a very different way than than what it's sort of like marketed as, but not in like a way that completely uh, negates like interacting with it or sort of um, uh, trying to discover what it can be. 
Yeah, I wanted to really bring that up just because so the listeners don't think we're like right libertarian, right, right, gold bug idiots. <laughs> that's the main re- that's the main reason why because that's the impression, right? Like most people's impression of Bitcoin is like that, just because of these people who dominate the space and. Naturally, the people who are often big proponents of Bitcoin who get the most publicity they t- tend to they, be they, more they, they, they uh, bourgeois. They tend to be like the worst fucking who people. Who have different interests. <laughs> <to be honest. laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah, like yeah. what the fuck in the Winklevoss brothers? Like the There's a lot. Those guys who like whatever lost their chance at Facebook. Who uh, th- Those brothers, yeah, like I don't know, they have that whole idea, whatever, Bitcoin to million dollars. Yeah, so now moving on to probably... The th- things I'm most excited to ask is what are some use cases of blockchain for the left? And I want to separate this into kind of two questions. So like the, the block, what, what can the left number one use? Like, how can we use blockchain now? What are use cases being employed now? Like what are some emancipatory, progressive, useful um, use cases of cryptocurrency now and also what could be some use cases in socialism that's Mm. for later we can separate that into two parts but for now like what are like we mentioned you mentioned decentralized autonomous organizations yeah so i i i i i made a list before in preparation for this uh interview since you told me i would talk about use cases but perfect um you know stop me whenever i'm uh (laughs) i'm talking too much because there's a lot i think part, part of the problem is you have to like keep in mind at least for further leftists out there, like whenever similar to like explaining communism to like one of your normie friends, it can sometimes take just like hours to help them wrap their head around like just the basics and some of like the ideas and, and like what it means. And so like it, I, I suffer from like doubly that issue because sometimes I have to explain like the politics part of it. And I have to, disc- uh, to explain the, the technology part of it, which are, both like kind of technically like not easy to wrap your head around and like i can totally understand why it's it's not an easy subject so just just to preface with that so some of the things like can go over your head or it doesn't really like like if i explain something like a dao or decentralized autonomous organization because you have no model in your head of what that is it's hard to wrap your 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 head around it unless you like a bit if you like just either research it for a long time or you actually do it decentralized <laughs> autonomous dads that's that's what they stand um, for but dads. so like the the one very very obvious and simple thing that cryptocurrency sort of is helpful for on the left and as well like almost anybody that sort of um comes against like some sort of censorship is the fact that it is censorship resistance um, so like one big example is getting around sanctions. So countries like Iran and Venezuela, uh, Cuba, a lot of these countries that suffer under US sanctions uh, who are not able to like trade or use the international banking system for these reasons because of the United States. And it's like very, very uh, uh, like barbaric policy of economic sanctions is that a lot of people rely on cryptocurrency to sort of get around that. So like people in in these countries are not allowed to be employed by any US company. Uh, a lot of them can't get jobs uh, outside yep. of their countries because of these sanctions. Uh, these countries cannot do trade. They can't do normal trade with one another because they cannot use the, the banking system. I should also add like a big part of the, the sanctions is a U.S. business can't, for example, sell product to like, uh, in, let's say, an Iranian business yeah. or Iranian consumer or a Venezuelan consumer, a Cuban consumer. And at the same time, also Cuban businesses, Iranian businesses can't um, sell stuff to American companies, yeah. um, you know, U.S. consumers. Yeah. And American companies, because this, it's not like just like uh, it's. It's clever because they enforce this globally because, for example, like if you do, if you're like a European business that does business with Cuban businesses, you can't enter the U.S. for like a set amount of days, like something like 90 days or 180 days, something I forget exactly. But it's it just deter. It's the whole point is to kind of like crush their economy. It's like you said, barbaric. But yeah, just to clarify that, because there's sometimes sanctions about there's there's confusion about what exactly sanctions are. Indeed. So like. Um, it's been already reported that Iran and Venezuela, for example, have done trade with one another using Bitcoin, 
because they've been able to pay uh, one of them paid the other one for some sort of like oil um and like it, it it worked out they don't need to use like usually i think sometimes what these countries do is actually use us dollars like in cash uh, to commit these trades before but now they're able to do it like just using bitcoin um, but if you're using, if you're doing like a really big trade, you're like, you know, you're carrying pallets of of, of cash or whatever to to bring to the other country, which is not very um, practical. Uh, another example is just like normal state censorship. So the big example is WikiLeaks. Back in I believe in like 2011, uh, this was really like the the turning point for Bitcoin. Bitcoin before that was sort of just like a nerd thing that like people played around with, but didn't know what to do with. Um, but whenever WikiLeaks uh, sort of first released all of these documentation showing that the U.S. and its allies had committed major war crimes, uh, PayPal and all these different banks sort of cut off uh, relationships with WikiLeaks so people could not donate their money to WikiLeaks to support it uh, in its like efforts for um, you know exposing these uh, these secrets. Another example is SciHub. Uh, which also has a lot of state censorship. So SciHub, if you don't know, is like this uh, online site where you can go and you can get any um, a scientific article for free. So like if you if you are a scientist in maybe a third world country or you don't have like the, the, the appropriate credentials and like access to all of these privately owned scientific journals, then you can't read these papers. And these papers are like, they're like forty dollars. Like they're they're pretty expensive for like a few pages of a paper. SciHub provides all of that for free uh, because uh, they strongly believe that in information and knowledge should be free. Uh, and the woman who started it, Alexandra Albakian, is a is a communist. I interviewed her for my podcast as well, so you can uh, hear from her like her takes on what why she thinks cryptocurrency is important because she only accepts cryptocurrency as donation. She cannot accept. PayPal, she cannot accept any sort of uh, like wiring of money because she's illegal. Like what SciHub is completely illegal. She cannot open a bank account. It's just not possible. Um, and so she only uses cryptocurrency to get around those that, that type of like censorship. Very recently as well, if you saw Progressive International, um, just for like a more like a recent example, Progressive International was doing this drive to fund, uh, I believe it was like purchasing vaccines for Cuba. Uh, and ING, one of the banks, and PayPal both cut them off uh, from being able to send money. So like they could not receive money from from PayPal or ING. ING is like a huge bank in, in Europe. So like that that that's an issue that like we see we're going to see again and again on the left. If we are very serious about sort of countering capitalist power, we need to keep in mind that one of the first things that they're going to do is cut off our access to bank accounts and cut off our access to finance to like the current financial system because they like it is already um like financial surveillance is prevalent throughout the financial system right like uh, as soon as the government says like no you can't give them money a bank's going to do it. it's like a bank like is is quite careful about abiding with the law they're very heavily regulated so like we have to consider that any sort of real serious effort is going to involve like some amount of, of state censorship because the state is um, very committed to keeping capitalism and the status quo, at least like, you know, capitalist countries. I mean, this is really important point uh, because, you know, a lot of people will forget that we're in like some sort of democracy. You know, we have all this freedom. We're not like China, not like North Korea. But what people forget is that, you know, capitalism only laxes its censorship when you don't pose a threat right people like the people often forget what the about the two red scares you know mccarthyism these these were no doubt like times of totalitarianism for sure and when when one poses a threat uh the governments capitalist governments around the world resort to very authoritarian measures like you said, um, they have the power to really cut off someone's finances just by, because make no mistake, like banks being independent, PayPal being independent, private enterprise, whatever, 
the government can get them to do whatever they want at the end of the day. Like they, they have a lot of power. So if they can easily get, they can pressure PayPal to cut someone's finances or to make them like, yeah, not be able to use the services and access their funds. They can do that with banks. And that's a scary prospect. And there definitely needs to be a lot of thought put into like alternatives of how uh, leftists can fund organizations, can support, yeah. have support networks. And, and, and this isn't to say that like, Oh, you know, Bitcoin solved this problem and then we like get socialism. Like like obviously that's not that's <laughs> not what the argument is. The argument is like a much smaller <laughs> thing of like a very possible situation that probably will happen again and again as you like as if you know, assuming that the left builds power, then the situation is going to keep happening and there needs to be some sort of like backup to that or else you know, you're just going to fall into the same issue over and over and over again. So it's important to have some sort of backup plan. I think that is like completely practical. It is not like utopian. It is not like, you know, I'm not a crypto booster. It is really just like that is the reality. Um, yeah, it's utopian to think that one can implement massive social change without overcoming right, like state exactly. resistance. Like the idea that, oh, the government will just be okay with all this. That's totally utopian, you know? Uh, so, like, there needs to be a lot of thought about that. And um, Also, you know, I was really surprised to see when I saw the articles about Cuba, you know, experimenting with cryptocurrency. And um, I heard about Iran and Venezuela before. But it's really, that's really interesting. And that says something, you know? And also Hillary Clinton coming out saying, uh, condemning cryptocurrency, saying that it can destabilize right. our currencies. I mean that like if if Hillary Clinton like not to be fucking two dimensional but <laughs> Hillary Clinton hates something it's got to be good but it also like I mean really I feel like some, sometimes leftists will only like you said cherry pick the or only single out the libertarians who are crypto bugs but not miss that like actually existing whether you want to call them socialists but like you know socialists social democracies or and also anti imperialist countries mm. i'll say vaguely uh are adopting cryptocurrency like that says something and really like sanctions are extremely inhumane and we sh like that's something i totally support if they find a way to undermine u.s hegemony and right. you know serve their citizens like that's that's a great thing right um i mean also i kind of do want to hear a little bit more about that is like how can this how can the global south what lessons can the global south take from this? And North Korea is for sure mining mining cryptocurrency and like definitely stealing cryptocurrency from people. I'm pretty sure they're one of those. They pretty sure they have a team of hackers doing that. Yeah, and uh, also more recently, like Nicaragua mm. has also been sanctioned, and these all these can have like devastating effects on people. So, like, what are some lessons that countries who are sanctioned or afraid of being sanctioned i mean i i think the lesson is mostly that the u.s has hegemonic power over the world financial system and that's not like conspiratorial i think that is like really oh they know that i mean like the, in terms of the using cryptocurrency well right so like i think get around the that. lesson is because of that hegemonic power and if you want to like even remotely challenge u.s power then it is something to consider to like think about how do you use cryptocurrency for for this um of course it's not like it's not like an ideal situation but it is something that can probably uh, you can build some sort of infrastructure and institutions that can serve your purposes for that particular moment uh so i think the the lesson is largely like hey consider mining cryptocurrency maybe or consider like having some store uh, or some savings of cryptocurrency just in case that 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 happens and this isn't really just for countries that have sanctions but also for left-wing organizations if you are serious about challenging capitalist power i think that is like not it's not that crazy to say that there's a good chance at some point in the future it could come in handy if you become big enough as soon as like joe biden says that like you know uh anarchists shouldn't have access to bank accounts or whatever like like things change very drastically very quickly. Well, he's already uh, attacking uh, so-called extremists on both sides. Like 
he's using the whole Capitol Hill thing to say, oh, we know we want to crack down on extremism on the far left and the far right. And that's why like anyone who's for like this censorship, even of people on the right, you should look at very critically as to who mm. it's coming from. I, I really think people are naive to think that you're going to rely on a neoliberal government to stomp out fascists. They're, they're going to use that power to stomp out like the left. So that's, that's, one, that's one of the things I want to also make clear is that like, if you are advocating for like a complete ban of cryptocurrency or a ban of, of blockchain or whatever, like you dra I think you are drastically underestimating the amount of states, like expansion of state surveillance powers that would need to happen to make that ban happen. Because, and like, and to think that as well, that like that expansion of state surveillance isn't going to hurt the left in the long run anyways. Like, I think that that is just like a very poor. Yeah, like it just never works out well. Like, I don't know, anyone who would rely on the neoliberal state for protection is super misguided. Uh, but also, you mentioned funding like organizations, cryptocurrency. How, what would that look like? If, let's say there's like a Vanguard party, whatever, like the Marxist Leninist in the listening or whatever, how you, however one wants to structure their party. Let's say there's a party. And, uh, you know, it's hard to get finances. They can easily be cut off. In what way can they use cryptocurrency to sort of like maintain their Literally organization? just put a, a crypto wallet address on their website. You know, that, 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 that's one thing. So uh, if, if, if you have, that, that's basically what WikiLeaks did is like they had their website and they had their Bitcoin address and they said, hey, we've lost our ability to access our money through PayPal and banks. Can you send Bitcoin to this address? And they made a shit ton of money off of it. It's, I would argue, one of the only reasons why they're still around is because they were accepting Bitcoin at the time. And of course, they've gotten very lucky. They've gotten very lucky with the market as well, probably. Um, and is, you know, one of probably few reasons why they're still around, it, it, I, w I would guess. Yeah, I asked that question knowing, knowing the answer, but like I'm sure a lot of people listening don't know that. And it's really interesting, I think, very, one of the most like practical use cases. And it's funny because once I saw an article, it was saying uh, far right extremists are using Bitcoin to fund their organizations because apparently yeah. Richard Spencer or some like some Nazi or whatever was using uh, like Bitcoin to fund their organizations. And they're like using that to attack Bitcoin. Yeah. And it's like, you idiots. Like <laughs> you guys, we could do the same thing, you know, like why don't we do we, that's a smart idea. It's like the it's not the point isn't that it's bad because of because they're doing it's bad it. fascists. <laughs> We're not. Yeah. So there's there needs to be thought about this. I mean, like the whole thing. This is why I'm I'm a little bit sometimes skeptical of political parties in this day and age. We're well, not just in this day and age. Political parties, like revolutionary parties, it's been very hard to mobilize. Like for example, um, there are so many FBI agents infiltrating yeah. um, Maoist parties, infiltrating the Black Panthers. Uh, it's just like, it's so difficult. And also it's like the Black Panthers had a really hard time getting finances. They often had to like do right. crime to finance uh, their operations. It's really hard. So like actually, you know, crowdfunding via like in, uh, a cryptocurrency it's, can be very useful. Now this brings me also to another question. A lot of things that's associated with... Um, different cryptocurrencies is the anonymity. Um, and I think there's some misleading mm. narratives about that. Uh, can you tell us about that? Like in what way does Bitcoin, does it help like anonymity um, yeah, and so that, privacy? That one is really like a, it depends on who's looking for you type of question. Um, so like the, the Bitcoin blockchain and, 90% of other blockchains um, is like it's 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 open source and and public information so like every single transaction that happens on on a blockchain is sort of publicly recorded anybody can see the ledger so anybody can see you know who is sending money to who the difference is that here your identity is solely your uh, like your your wallet address which is like a random string of numbers and letters uh and so like it's more like it's pseudo anonymous sort of like by default that you know um this random string of numbers and letters is sending one bitcoin to this other random string of number numbers and letters uh so like 
by default, I cannot, I don't know who is behind these addresses, but if I have like the capabilities and the resources, I can find out who is behind uh, those addresses if I really, really try to. Uh, so like the most way that people get their cryptocurrency are through centralized exchanges. So like this is Coinbase, Gemini, Crypto.com, like all these different companies, they have to abide by KYC or know your customer regulations in which they have to have a copy of a lot of your personal information. Uh, and therefore they know who you are when you're buying cryptocurrency on their platforms. And so if you send your cryptocurrency off of their platform into your wallet, they know probably which wallet is yours, right? Because you're sending it off of their platform. And like if the state comes knocking on the door, they're probably going to give that information. Like maybe they'll put up a fight, but like eventually probably they'll give it. Um, so like in that way, they, the like the state, you know, the FBI or whoever else can sort of like figure out who you are. That's one way. Another way is also an extremely technical conversation that whenever you send like a, a transaction or something like that, part of your metadata of your transaction gets leaked as well to the specific node that you are uh, sending your transaction to. So there is a, I, I did a, an interview with Harry Halpin. So he's sort of like a, a security and like privacy advocate who's um, building this company called NIM, which is like basically Tor, but like more sustainable. Um, so like a way to have anonymity over the web. And he's just, is particularly interested in like keeping anonymity um, like on cryptocurrency networks uh, a possibility by using the NIM network. But um, so those are like two ways in which your information can be leaked. However, there are also ways in which you can counter that. So there's a lot of like, it's really like, it's a battle. It's really, really interesting actually. So like if you wanted to, you could use alternative uh, cryptocurrencies like Monero which are completely anonymous or Zcash, which have a lot more anonymity built in. So a lot of the transactions are not, they're not publicly yeah, available. Yeah, i heard about those. Uh, they use like different cryptographic uh, mechanisms to make that happen. A very technical conversation that's probably not necessary. But as well, you can use things called coin tumblers or coin mixers. So that's where like, it's basically a separate service where you send your cryptocurrency to them they mix up the cryptocurrency of a bunch of other people and then they send out uh, the cryptocurrency out to the like addresses that you've told them to send it out to. So in that way, it sort of anonymizes uh, like which which wallets are, are yours or not. Um, so it's like, it's this constant battle back and forth on like who's able to know like what information about who. Um, so it's a complicated question. Basically, if you do nothing about it, then like people can easily find out who you are. But there are tools out there in which you can increase your anonymity. So I, I would look at it as like a scale rather than like as, you know, either you are anonymous or not. So, yeah, you have uh, also a lot of other uh, use cases on your list, I believe, right? You had a bunch you came in with. So feel free to tell us more about those in different ways the left could potentially use crypto now and you know a uh, you know future post capitalist sure, yeah. so like, society <laughs> so looking at my list i have 12 things and i've gotten through two of them <laughs> but those but those but those first two oh, were re damn. are really like fundamental and like i think the easiest to understand for people that's why i really wanted to like kind of why i focus so much time on them i think um because these next ones are sort of like if you're starting from knowing nothing this is like a couple of levels higher, right? This is uh, like a couple of levels of, of like thinking and like research you kind of uh, need to do before you like really wrap your head around sort of like if you're trying to explain communism to like your grandmother or something like that. But uh, I think one thing that we should also think about if we're expanding, so right, we said that Bitcoin was, what's good about Bitcoin is that it is censorship resistant just like most other cryptocurrencies, honestly, they are censorship resistant. So you don't only have to use Bitcoin. So you can send and receive things back and forth between people without needing a third party uh, in the sense that like you don't need the, 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 uh, like the permission of the state or of the banks, which is important and like uh, really useful. 
Now, if we expand to the other functionalities that we mentioned early in the interview, for example, with smart contracts and things like this, we can also think about using cryptocurrency as a form of basically a resilient cross-border mechanism for coordination. So coordination in a lot of different ways and doing a lot of different things that don't only have to do with like sending money. Uh, so like the one way that we can think about blockchains is really as like an economic platform to build very resilient institutions because these, uh, because the blockchain itself is so resilient uh, because of its decentralized infrastructure. We can argue, of course, in debate about the extent of the decentralization in different contexts, but the fact that it is permissionless and that anybody can sort of take part in it and do what they want with it is an important affordance that's given to us that we are not afforded with other technologies at the moment. Uh, so like you can imagine, uh, so there are things, for example, like multi-signature wallets. So this is, you can think of this as like a joint bank account that you hold with your friends, except you don't need to like go through a bank to start that bank account. So you don't need you know, to give your information, you don't need to like, um, go through KYC, you don't need to like, um, make sure that you're not on some blacklist from the government. And you can create a bank account in which you can hold assets together collectively with maybe a group of comrades or something like that. So this is interesting in, for example, let's say you are going on strike as, uh, you know, as a union or something like that. What's really common actually, is that when unions go on strike, uh, banks prevent them from accessing their money as well. So when like going on strike is actually, it's really in a gray area of legality for a lot of different jurisdictions. And so not being able to access your bank account means that you don't have access to money to pay the workers to continue to go on strike. So you can raise all this money for strike funds and then all of a sudden you can't access it because the bank has said no. So all of that money that all of the dues that people are giving you and the money that you're making off of that for your, you know, whatever you are using it for, like you won't be able to access it that. So like I think cryptocurrency as uh, so like resilient coordination around, for example, managing strikes is something really interesting. Um, so we can use that not only as like continuing like the first two like use cases I, I lined out where the sending of like cryptocurrencies is uh, censorship resistant, but also you can use smart contracts to build out like different uh, governance mechanisms around the very assets in which you hold together. So if you are, I mean, workers owning collectively this money, you can sort of set up a mechanism to where, for example, you could vote on what you actually do with that money. So do you actually want to put all of this money towards the strike fund? Do you want to use this money for paying everyone to be able to buy food, pay rent, et cetera, while you're on strike? You can do that and you don't need uh, permission from banks or states to be able to do that. And that's, I think, very powerful. Um, you can also think of it, I think, as like a platform that can centralize already decentralized movements. So the left being one of those types of decentralized movements, right? We, like there are so many different uh, types of leftists out there with different uh, adjectives that they want to put in front of themselves and different labels in which they all sort of argue with one another over sort of like esoteric differences. Um, but what is interesting is that this can provide, I think, as a shared platform for economic collaboration for joint action in a way that like makes it difficult for like different tendencies to not work with one another and instead to promote unity and to promote collaboration with one another rather than at the moment where it's like there is no joint bank account for the left. There's no joint bank accounts for, I mean, even just like Marxist Leninists or whatever, you know, like one political tendency even struggles to have like a united front. Uh, and so like creating a platform that is built on top of smart contracts, um, which are resilient from the states and which are resilient from banks, 
uh, that you can use to facilitate governance mechanisms that are otherwise not possible and to facilitate the flow of assets in ways that are not possible otherwise is also a very powerful thing. So, I mean, you can imagine. So this is really like the idea of a decentralized autonomous organization, but like expanded of thinking of it as just like the entire left, I think would be really interesting. Of course, I don't think the entire left, if you try to do it, is going to join immediately. I think only like certain parts of the left are, would like join such a thing um, and may only join after like uh, seeing it work or something like that. Uh, but it's something that you can build already um, without needing like permission to do so. So sort of like the, the, the upside of permissionless networks like blockchains. So uh, now I'm at four. <laughs> yeah, go for it. That was really interesting. Yeah, sure. I, I, so I can continue. So th those are like, I think like more, like really, really, I think gets at like the core of what I find like interesting from like a utopian, but also I think personally that it's also like a practical, it solves like a practical need on the left. Um, but you can also think of like smaller things as well. So like, I think cryptocurrency could be is already shown to be really um, as like a potential like avenue for funding cooperatives. So there's one cooperative, a platform cooperative called Ampled. Um, which is basically, it's kind of like Patreon, but it's meant just for artists and musicians um, where you pay some like, uh, I'm a member of the cooperative. So I, I, I'm a community member. I pay like $3 a month or something like that. Um, and like, uh, I, I support the cooperative and these like musicians because especially in like the pandemic, it's been very difficult to make money. Like streaming platforms are very shitty for musicians. They make very, very little money off of it, but that's like where most people listen to their music. Um, so they're using uh, basically what's called a social token. So they're creating their own token that's used within Ampled to sort of bootstrap uh, the Ampled cooperative itself because they don't they don't have a lot of money. They don't get like venture capital funding like a normal startup does. They simply create their own token, the Ampled token, in which they use to give to each other people who are working on the cooperative as they have time to do so. Uh, and then that token is able to be traded on cryptocurrency markets where they can then trade it if they want to, to like to money and then pay off their rent. And then that token will have some sort of value, uh, like it'll be used for governance of the platform uh, cooperative itself. Uh, so I think that's a really interesting idea. We're also, I, I have a project called Breadchain Cooperative where me and a bunch of others in the community are um, building sort of like overtly left-wing blockchain applications to explore um, where, I mean, we're basically using cryptocurrency to like fund ourselves, to be honest. Um, and so we're doing that in various different ways. There's also this idea that's sort of similar called Exit to Community, which was uh, coined by Nathan Schneider, who's like a, a big cooperatives uh, academic and platform cooperative academic, and who's actually like quite um, influential in the uh, blockchain space. But um, exit to community is basically this idea that uh, as a startup, you don't have many options for like cashing out. The only option that you have is you either sell to a larger company or you IPO. And both of those options are not very egalitarian. They're both very centralizing uh, over time. Uh, so instead, he proposed this third option called Exit to Community, where people who actually use the platform that you have created can purchase a share into the company as a way to, as a founder, you can cash out and like remunerate yourself for the work that you did of like starting uh, a platform or something like that. Um, so like there have already been uh, DAOs who have done similarly. So ENS, the Ethereum name service, uh, which is an NFT actually. Uh, so if you like on Twitter, if you see like, you know, name.eth, that's a, an ENS name, the Ethereum name service, uh, which is basically like, instead of giving your like wallet address of like random numbers of letters, you can give someone your ENS name. Uh, and in that way they don't have to memorize or they don't have to like copy and paste your, your random numbers and letters. Um, the whole ENS system has basically done an exit to community where they created the ENS token, which is sort of like the governance token over the platform and protocol. Uh, and they've given out to everybody 
who owned an ENS name. So basically, all these people who had made an ENS name made they made like several thousand dollars worth in cryptocurrency simply because they were using that protocol. And so they've like basically given ownership and governance over that protocol to the community itself. Um, and there's there's like a lot of different projects that are doing very similarly using airdrops as a way to basically spread decentralize the ownership of the means of production. So like this is something that really is like not possible to do without without blockchain without cryptocurrency like the it just like has not happened before. It is actually a novel thing. So that's uh, another thing. Uh, another one I have are mutual credit systems. Can you actually elaborate on that? Just because that's like. Right. So like hard to this process. is what I'm talking about. It's like, it's I mean, a couple of levels above. That's why sometimes it's a struggle to like get people yeah. to wrap their heads around. Um, I mean, okay. So uh, one, one thing is like, I can hear an objection is someone might say, well, you know, I can do worker cooperatives without blockchain. Oh, what do I, no, need I mean, blockchain? yeah, that is true. You can, yeah, of course you can. Saying, <laughs> you're saying, and yeah. And you were saying like, Something that isn't possible without blockchain. Can you elaborate on that What is not possible exactly? without blockchain, at least not possible like nearly as easily, is this exit to community. Like exit, exit to community is possible. You could set up the legal infrastructure to do that. It's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to cost a lot of time to do it. Um, but creating a token and then airdropping it is what it's called. Airdropping it to people who use your application or product is extremely easy to do. Like because all of these interactions and transactions on the blockchain are public because you can know who's done it and who has not. You can collect that information of all of the people who have ever used your application. You can see how much they've spent on it, they can see how much they've used it. You already create a list of all of of like your entire community of people who are who who like like your pro your, your product your platform your application like the idea of exit to community is give you know give Uber or give like one of these platforms to the people who actually use it and care about the product itself or that application or platform itself rather than having it owned by fucking BlackRock or you know whatever billion next billionaire is going to own the next uh, unicorn so like it's 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 an alternative uh, to IPOs or uh, like a buyout. Um, so yeah, I, I I would argue extremely strongly that that's only possible with uh, a cryptocurrency yeah. or a blockchain in a way that is like uh, feasible uh, without needing to like pay a lot of money in legal fees. Um, so yeah, so that's that's one way. Uh, another thing that I think is interesting, um, there are also a, a mutual credit systems. So if you don't know what mutual credit is like an alternative type of monetary system where instead of like, it's, it's not, it's not the same as like thinking of money as a commodity. It's instead thinking of money as like a social credit in the sense that everybody has the ability to create money. Everybody has the ability to give credit to one another. All you have to do is keep track of the balances between everyone. Uh, so like if I, I can send five credits to you and then on the ledger, it'll say that you are plus five credits and I am minus five credits. So this is like a really alternative uh, monetary system. It's more it's more common in like anarchist uh, thought and theory. Uh, but it is like, I think, a really interesting alternative monetary system that is, I would bet, is a lot more practical than like labor vouchers or something like that, that like some Marxists like to like to talk about. And like I say this as as like I'm more amenable to Marxism and than anarchism like generally, but I think mutual credits are like much they actually have practical use and like there are communities who do use mutual credit systems. It's basically an IOU you can think of it. Is this like a invention kind of of mutualism? Uh, I'm not sure if it's an invention of mutualism. I mean, it's, I think it's something that has like existed probably well before anarchism was ever like. Uh, a coherent like political theory um i would guess really because anarchism has been around like since at least like, yeah. the 1700s more developed in the 1800s so that's like 
pretty. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know, I don't know the history exactly, but like I old. do know of like communities in different places who do use it, um, because like it, and it, it's it's actually an, it's an extremely simple idea, and it's something that doesn't require any commodity. It doesn't require like any type of like central authority uh, to do it necessarily. Um, like you can facilitate within a community. The what what blockchain brings to the mutual credit world, though, is sort of uh, uh, creating a platform in which it is like globally available. Uh, so you get to take advantage of like the global nature of the internet to facilitate mutual credit systems. When usually most mutual credit systems uh, are just sort of like hyper local, like hyper small communities, usually in which they sort of give one another mutual credits uh, to sort of, you know, deal with each other's debts and like to work for each other or not. Now, this is really like the interesting territory I wanted to get into because like this is now when we start to talk about like changing the social relations of production, which is... Yeah, it's a really different, it's a really different social relation because it, you're like right now we live in a system where money is created by central authority, by like the government, for example, by the like, you know, what people call the, the fiat system, central banks. Central banks. Like, I, like my argument against like you know, libertarians would be that the problem is not necessarily just that. The problem is that is very like anti-democratic the way that it's done. This is very different than like commodity money than like a gold standard because it's it doesn't require some like, you know, thing which is like ultimately valuable uh, in the way that like gold bugs want gold to be. Yeah. And this is like, this is where, where, where I see like, if I understand correctly, the purpose of this credit system is just really to be a unit of accounts and to kind of keep track of IOUs, which IOUs, this is the thing like I hear, you know, anarchists and even some Marxists say, oh, we need a classless, mm -hmm. moneyless society. And sometimes uh, I've heard people call labor vouchers money. It's really not in the same sense that we like use money as like an accumulation Right. Um, and in this sense, like th th this credit system is not money at all in that, that way either. Like money, we didn't invent money. Isn't like, you know, they're saying money is the root of all evil. I mean, it really depends on what kind of money you're talking about, because we've used we've used some sort of quote unquote money since like we've mm -hmm. invented writing. And it's not like always money isn't always like this thing. Oh, I can get as much as I want. It's just a unit of account to keep track of IOUs. And we'll, we're going to need something like that. So like when we say like moneyless society, it's not going to be like we don't have, we just like 3D print things infinitely. And there's no way to like keep track. We're, there's always going to be some way to need like a unit of account to keep track of things that are number one scarce and also to quantify yeah. labor and like exchange and stuff. So I can, I see that as really interesting. Like, I think there's a lot of thought because for me, like really like the alternative to the money system that I know about is just really the labor voucher system, which Marx talks about and some theorists like Paul yeah. Cockshot talk about. Uh, but uh, like, this is really interesting to me. Like, uh, I would like to really, is there, is there anywhere like where people can learn uh, more about this? I mean, the, if, if you look it up, like there's, there's plenty of resources. Um, if, if, if you want to learn about like the theory in general, I'm not like, super in depth into uh the theory in general but i do know like a couple of projects that are working on this uh in the crypto world so um, you have trust lines uh, is one of them they're sort of like a general mutual credit system that people can set up using their phones um, that uses a blockchain and then you have circles ubi which is a very interesting project based in berlin where they have like a real cooperative cafe right, yeah. in berlin that accepts uh, circles, which is like their mutual credit system, uh, where you can purchase like coffee there or whatever. And, you know, there, there's a pretty big global community of people, uh, who use the circles like mutual credit system. And it's also at the same time, a UBI. So every day people earn eight circles, uh, if they're a part of the network, uh, and they can use that to purchase stuff. Um, so like, there, there's a lot of very interesting like experimentation that's that's happening in in that regard, um, but yeah, I, I would say like a Google search and you can find like a lot of really really interesting information about it. I mean, these are these all seem like very sophist very uh, novel ways of of kind of uh, employing yes. tools to organize. 
because we often often the left thinks about organizing in a fairly one dimensional way. You know, like not all organizing right. is just picket signs or like <laughs> newspapers or whatever. I mean, there's other ways to like do activism, right? And I think one way is strengthening the uh, just the strength of yeah. the organizations. And, you know, having, being able to like fund your organizations and also like uh, in a decentralized way interests me. Now, another thing I've heard you talk about before is, I'm sure this is on your list, is one of the, or even is uh, like ways that blockchain can kind of help mm. with democracy and voting. Yeah. I'm so like, in that. you have, when, 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 again, like I mentioned before, when I, when I say token, that you can create a token on a blockchain you need to think of token as like the most abstract thing possible, which sort of you can impart value into it in many different ways, depending on the context that that token sort of exists in. So like a token can be a type of financial speculative asset on a blockchain for sure. That's like the most common one. They're everywhere. Like no one's going to deny that. But you can also think of a token as a vote, as like, voting towards something because of the context and like the application in which you have built it to be used in. So in cryptocurrency world, usually these things are referred to as governance tokens. So basically it's a token that you are, that you are using to like show how you would like to govern a particular platform that is associated with that token. Um, and so like basically what what is really interesting is that you can create very very easily like democratic institutions and like facilitate democratic processes using smart contracts in a way that is very resilient and very like easy to trust because you can see like what exactly is going to happen of course there is like you have to know how to read a little bit of code and like People do this, like people audit the code if, when, when they're doing these type of things. But it makes a way to where it's very, very easy to set up like some sort of democratic votes or some sort of uh, poll or something like that. Uh, and it happens all the time in the cryptocurrency world. It's just that the left is sort of like not really looking at it or, you know, are critiquing it in in, in some ways. And there are valid critiques because... So like the most popular way of facilitating these type of votes uh, is called token governance. So you have these governance tokens um, that are basically purchasable on the free market. Uh, so if you look at very popular uh, decentralized exchanges, like Uniswap, for example, is one decentralized exchange that uses smart contracts to facilitate trades between different tokens. Um, Uniswap has their own governance token called the Uni token, and you can purchase that token on its marketplace, uh, and the market sort of determines what the price of that is. And you can also earn the governance token by being what's called a liquidity provider for specific uh, pools of tokens. So they're, they're, those are the two ways in which you can like earn that governance token. Uniswap has a separate page called governance where they have basically uh, votes. So like they'll have like a proposal, you know, like should we add this token and this token to the list of tokens that we allow on our, on our application and that, you know, we will add some sort of incentivization mechanism. And it'll require like X amount of tokens to be voted uh, in either yes or no for it to pass. So like they're facilitating a type of democratic process, but it's a very like clearly a flawed one because if you have a lot of money, you can just buy a lot of the governance token, right? It's 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 like not that different from like um like yeah. stock shares or something like that. That's all I the was about issue, to say. Yeah. Uh, like that people are now seeing with that is of course the very criticisms that you would make as a socialist. And so like this is like really what I'm describing is like, you know, version one of trying to make democracy 
on a blockchain sort of type of application in like a, a feasible way. And it's like very, very flawed. People are very aware of that. I think people don't like it. What ends up happening is that they have, they put up a, a proposal for a vote. Uh, venture capital firms and like investment banks, investment firms own a significant chunk of their governance tokens. And so what they do is they, they, they just wait until the, the, the vote is like right about to end. And they just like, they, they, they spend a shit ton of tokens on like yes or no, depending on what they want right before it ends. So like people can think that like yes is winning because people are voting yes, but then this huge whale just like puts in a million tokens on no and then it's a no. So like basically they were able to... Yeah, it's like super delegates. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So like they're able to like, they're using time on their side to sort of like just wait until they like pounce on what they want to actually happen. So then other people don't really get a chance to like make that happen. Um, but so like those those are the bad examples of democracy happening on, on cryptocurrency and blockchain networks. But there are lots of different alternatives in which you can make democracy like more viable. Um, so like cooperatives are used to having like one member, one vote. And like that's, it's a slightly more difficult thing to do on a blockchain network because anybody can sort of like create as many wallets as they want. But it is something that is possible if you like make the process to happen. So like um, there is a, a worker cooperative called Dorg, which is like a, a blockchain uh, a cryptocurrency development collective who basically, they, they function basically as a, as a worker cooperative. Uh, and they have like a really, really interesting way in how they vote on things within like their cooperative. Uh, they have basically, they don't do exactly one member, one vote, but they have like a, uh, they have a thing called a reputation. And so they use reputation as sort of, uh, it's like a token that is given to people as they work for the cooperative. So they, the more that they work for it, uh, the more reputation token they can get. And then the reputation token sort of decays uh, over time. Uh, so like they can they can vote on things uh, if they want to, to like sort of make the cooperative go in one direction or the other. Uh, it also gives them rights to sort of like the profits at the end of the quarter. Uh, but so like they can, uh, they're able to use, because of the programmability, they're able to add like a lot of nuance and a lot of like, interesting adjustments if they want to with like their governance token and with their governance mechanisms that sort of it doesn't they, they get a lot closer to one member one vote i think if they wanted to do one member one vote they could do it because they know everybody who's working on the cooperative but they've chosen not to because people just work different amounts of time for the cooperative but yeah there's a lot of very very interesting uh, experimentation that's happening that i think people would find very interesting if they would pay attention to it yeah, and I would also say um, the motto for anyone who like this is pretty uh, you know complicated stuff, uh, and you know I I still have trouble understanding a lot of this because I'm still very much new to this space. So the motto I like to kind of can encourage people to have is if you don't really know much about something, you know you should like <laughs> wait a bit till you have like hot takes on it. Also look into it. You know, I, I've developed this just over time because like I'm very much like a student of history, political economy and philosophy. So, you know, these are fields that like you question your assumptions all the time. So I've kind of gotten a bit of a I'm, I'm very much hesitant to give like final takes or role form opinions, so to speak, on things like I don't know enough about. So, I would, yeah, I encourage like uh, to not only research, but. I mean, as as you're saying, a lot of this is still being experimented with. Like any technology that's sort of new needs to, a lot of experimentation to see what potentialities it has. Uh, <laughs> and speaking of potentialities, <laughs> sure, you I can get there if you, few more on the I'm, list. I, uh, if you're still listening to it at this point, I really salute you for uh, for getting through it. So yeah, so like uh, another thing I wanted to mention was sort of thinking about. This is sort of related to basically what we were already talking about, but like governance of a global digital commons. So whenever we think of like the default mode of cryptocurrency or blockchain world, we may think of like people who are obsessed with financial return and like their own individual returns uh, on their money or their cryptocurrency. 
And that's because sort of like the applications in which they're interacting with are designed in that way on purpose. Like that's that's how they're like getting users to do it. But we need to keep in mind that uh, the programmability of smart contracts are Turing complete. So theoretically, you can you can architect different types of applications for different types of ends. And that includes ends that are more commons oriented or like holding things in common. So like this is also, of course, related to like cooperatives. This is also related to like a whole bunch of different things. But like thinking of the Internet and like things that are built on the Internet as a type of global digital commons and using uh, these types of uh, technologies and infrastructures as a way to facilitate the governance over those commons. So like historically, um, well, I mean, like sort of the, the the stereotype is people think about like, oh, you know, like the tragedy of the commons is that like we can't hold everything in common because we just like argue too much or something like it's like very ahistorical, like a lot of natural reason. Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> That's that's so like easily debunkable. To yeah, me throughout history, there, there's so much like work debunking that. Yeah. yeah. So like, what is really interesting is that there is quite a few people in the cryptocurrency space who are really big fans of Eleanor Ostrom, who is like the she's like the matriarch of of like commons theory, um, and how like she's done. She was like I think she was an economist, but she looked into like the anthropological uh, work behind like how different groups hold things in common. And they're like, you know, there's like certain rules in which like all of these sort of communities sort of follow and other dudes. Wait, her name is Eleanor Commons? Eleanor Ostrom, sorry. You know, Eleanor Ostrom. And she's, a, I mean, she's, she's. I think she describes herself as a liberal economist. She's no socialist, but she did do interesting work on like, like the anthropological work uh, behind like how people hold things in common. Um, but like applying that in a, in a, in a digital world and in like a digital environment. Uh, so there's a lot of like interesting projects that are looking into that and like building these like governance primitives for being able to facilitate that. So projects like the Common Stack is one that's 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 pretty big in doing that. Uh, token engineering Commons. Um, so these are like the type of groups that are sort of like interested. If you really dig into it, they're all really into basically cybernetic c- cybernetic design uh, for the Commons. Um, so like you, there's a lot of like cyberneticists and like system engineers who are working on, um, on, on this type of work. Um, another thing is data sovereignty. So like at the moment, the way that we interact with all of the different platforms that we interact with is basically we agree to the terms and services and we give them our data for them to collect, for them to make money off of. That's how like basically every big tech platform makes this money more or less, um, at least in, in one shape or another. Uh, what blockchain allows to do in, and not just blockchain, there are also like different other distributed ledger technology technologies that can also facilitate something very similar is that uh, it allows you to sort of opt in or out to giving your data uh, to companies. Um, So basically you can, through decentralized technologies, you're able to have more sovereignty over the data that you produce on these platforms so that you can have a say in whether or not you want them to to have access to that data or what have you. So like one one project um, that I think is interesting is called Decode, D-E-C-O-D-E, which is like an EU funded project actually. the it, it uses a blockchain, but there's no like cryptocurrency involved in it at all. It's purely a blockchain for data sovereignty uh, that's been tested in different European cities. So I think Amsterdam, Barcelona, London, maybe one other one uh, where they're they're piloting the project where they're using blockchain and uh, different cryptographic proofs as a way to sort of allow citizens to opt in or out to like the city being able to use their data or something like that, or like which pieces of information they want the city to have uh, or companies to have. Uh, Then you have like different solutions, different like other types of like decentralized file storage solutions like Filecoin, uh, where it's basically like you can, 
well, decentralized file storage as opposed to centralized file storage where you are giving all of your data to a centralized server, which is owned by a company uh, who owns a lot of data. Um, instead, you are creating this entire infrastructure where people may run their own servers where they hold data uh, and maybe like they are paid in a cryptocurrency token to do so. Uh, so I think that's it's it 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 changes the paradigm quite a bit. It, it it I think it reduces the control that a lot of these big tech companies have over the data that 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 they collect. Um, so I think that's really interesting. Uh, and then now, so I'm at I'm at like my um, so this 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 one I wanted to mention is more like a, a very utopian type of socialist blockchain socialist idea I would say. Um, is this the Mario and Luigi the example? Mario and Luigi example. Sick. Okay. I've heard, yeah, I heard you talk about it on your <laughs> podcast or somewhere. Yeah. So like I, I've written, I, I wrote a blog piece about it as well. If you go to like blog and then socialist use cases, but essentially um, because a token, you can impart whatever type of value you want on it. And it's like an empty, it's, it's, it's an empty symbol in which you impart Rep, like so, something about it based on the context. I think we can also think of tokens as like something to represent our rights as 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 people. So like, I think in any socialist utopia, uh, you would have like the right to housing for everyone. That would just be a given. Uh, so like in my socialist utopia, where we've achieved socialism and we're thinking about using blockchain maybe to like facilitate different administrative. Uh, tasks that we uh, maybe want to automate or something like that. Um, I have this housing for all token where uh, I use the example of like the Mushroom Kingdom uh, and you have Mario and Luigi who both want to like get a house to live in uh, and they're living in the socialist utopia of Mushroom Kingdom. Mario is a single dad. So he has a, he has baby Mario as his kid and then Luigi is a single guy. They both because they are citizens of the Mushroom Kingdom, a housing right token. So they get one token in which they could spend it on one house that they live in. Uh, because Mario is a single dad and he has a kid, his housing right token is encoded in such a way that he actually gets access to more space in his house and maybe like an extra room for his kid. So he gets he gets the right to do that because that type of information is sort of encoded in the a governance mechanism that is on the blockchain that's sort of facilitating the system. And then Luigi, his housing right token, uh, he can also spend it on a house, but it's for a smaller one because he's a single guy. He doesn't need that much space. Um, beforehand, the community has already determined what are the specific characteristics of people in which they get the right to get a bigger house or apartment to live in. So in this way, like I'm thinking of blockchain as like a, as a way to facilitate decentralized economic planning, as opposed to what people normally think about it as just like purely free market speculation. Um, so like yeah, and um, it's worth like right when when you're explaining that also it kind of embodies the Marx ideal is to each according to their ability, to each according to their yeah. need. Now, this requires planning to kind of distribute things. And there's different ways to go about that, obviously, right? Like, we don't want super bureaucratic, top-down planning. We want it to be as democratic as possible. So, like, the idea, you know, of having blockchain kind of help facilitate this is really interesting. And that's another thing about, like, Marx, too, is because, like, I want to say, like, you know, you mentioned utopian. I'm sure, you know, like, Marx isn't, like, a utopian. Uh his idea like high phase communism isn't going to come until number one, you have like a socialism and the proletariat like is in charge rather than the capitalists. It's a long process, right? Because for him, like high phase communism isn't even possible until you have technology that we can't even imagine. It's a very much like a process in the future. Like when he did predict revolutions happening in his time, it wasn't like he predicted high phase communism. He like saw like a very in an evolutionary way, like, you know, feudalism and you slave society is feudalism, uh, mercantilism, capitalism. Then you have like state capitalism, then uh, dictatorship of the proletariat. Then you have uh, low phase communism, communism, et cetera. 
as opposed to maybe some anarchists who might want to go straight to it. So it's interesting. Like I, I am very much in this regard, like a modernist and think we need like to envision technologies and social relations that can make the, these things possible. Mm. Right. Yeah. I think there is like the standard, there is like the, the standard critique of, well, we need to be careful with technology because they encode, they sort of force us to behave and interact and relate to one another in ways at which we don't want to relate with one another in like, and usually they're in the forms of like commodification or things like this. But at the same time, I think you can flip that on its head as well, where you can use technology to actually encode and create the type of social relationships that you do want. And that's like inherently going to happen and inherently what we want if we want to build socialism. Yeah, absolutely. No, f- no, fully agree. Uh, was that all you wanted to cover on your list? Um, and then I had, well, I had, I had my last one was basically the, if, if you guys are interested in like what we're, what, what, what I'm sort of building with a few others, then I would definitely check out uh, Breadchain Cooperative. So we have a Twitter page. Uh, if you just look up Breadchain, you should be able to find it. And what we're doing at the moment is we're working, it's basically, uh, it's a cooperative of cooperatives are meant to be. So we have projects that we're working on with Breadchain itself, like people who are in it. And then we're also like a network of different other sort of like left wing blockchain or or distributed ledger technology projects. Um, So right now it's only two other projects who are also in our network. Um, but one of them is PACT. So PACT is a mutual aid network based in New York City. And basically they're exploring the creation of what's called PACT DAO, where they're trying to create a DAO to sort of facilitate mutual aid networks uh, in uh, New York City and sort of expand that into other geographies. Um, so we're sort of, we're helping them in that in that journey. And uh, Breadchain, we're our first application that we're building that we're hoping to come out uh, in the coming months is what's called the crowd staking protocol, where what we do is um, users can send, uh, it's called DAI, D-A-I, which is a US dollar stable coin. So it's a cryptocurrency that's pegged to the US dollar. Uh, you send your DAI to a smart contract that smart contract then forwards your DAI to a lending pool. So it lends it out for interest. All of the interest that's generated from the money that you gave goes directly to the cooperative as a way to fund it. Uh, but when you'd ever, whenever you give your DAI to the smart contract, you also receive back in collateral a bread token, one-to-one. So one bread is equal to one DAI, which is equal to $1. Uh, and so what we've done basically is we've created a digital local currency in the bread token uh, in which by giving by by holding it, you are helping fund the cooperative, but also you can use that bread token to spend uh, to transact with others who are also part of the bread chain network. Uh, and by that way, you sort of are able to express yourself uh, sort of like a type of economic expression that you are a supporter of the cooperative economy in the blockchain space, uh, while also getting the same type of functionalities and the same types of things that you would get by just holding a like cryptocurrency stablecoin. Um, so that's like one of that's like one of our one of our projects in which we're trying to show like an explicit left wing use case um, for helping fund our cooperative specifically. Uh, by using the model of local currencies and sort of applying that in in the blockchain world, I got through my list. <laughs> awesome, yeah. I'm sure it's, anyone who's anyone who's uh, now listened to both parts of the interview with blockchain socialists, I applaud you for trying to understand this stuff. You're learning with this just as I am. Uh, so, and I'm sure many. I encourage many people to do that. And also, if you want to learn further. Look no further than Blockchain Socialist Podcast. Uh, a lot of good stuff on there, a lot of good interviews. And also check out the blog if if you still read. <laughs> no, people don't do that anymore. Yeah, the blockchainsocialist.com is where I hold uh, everything that I write and everything that I publish in terms of podcasts. Uh, I'm also on Twitter at, at TB Socialist. And we have as well a Discord and a subreddit. 
So the subreddit is r slash crypto leftists, uh, where you can find other people who are also discussing this type of very, very uh, niche topic of left wing politics and blockchain. Uh, and then if you join the Discord, it's a, it's fairly active and people are constantly having discussions about this type of thing. Um, so it's not like a, it's not a, a place for crypto boosters to sort of like shill you their coins. There's no talk about like price or speculation um, and instead is like more more serious about, you know, how do we apply it for a left wing cause? Yeah, I'm in the Discord. It's, it's a good Discord to be in. But that, but still, if you guys want to send us Bitcoin, uh, go go for it. You know, uh, Blockchain Socials has his address, I think. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. If you want to help either uh, my channel or his, you know, we both have patrons. Help us there. Patreon. Anyways, yeah. If you guys enjoyed, peace out.